Good morning, North Palm. Wow, praise the Lord. So good to be in the house of the Lord. So good to see you in the house of the Lord. I've got so much that I'm going to have to cut the frivolity out. Um, I'll just be honest with you. This, this word really... Um, has been messing with me, and I want to share with you from the book of Amos chapter 4, and then from uh, the gospel of John chapter 14. We've looked at John 13, 14, 15, and 16, and 17 some time, but there's a passage in there that, uh, that is so powerful, and I really believe that Holy Spirit is speaking this, and this is a word to many people. If you'd like the notes, text the word notes, N-O-T-E-S, to 843-755-6209. When you do that, it'll take you to Uversion Bible app, and you'll have more extensive notes than what are on the, the uh, projection, and then you'll be able to add to those notes if you would like and you'll be able to save them and use them later. So it's really a a fabulous tool. Amos chapter 4. Before we read, though, if you would take a moment, just lift your hands to the Lord. Pray this prayer with me. Holy Spirit, open my ears that I can hear what you have to say. Open my heart. Make it receptive. I give you permission to move deep in my life, to form my heart, to form my character. Jesus, have your way in me today. Amen. Amos chapter 4, verse 2. The Lord has sworn by his holiness. Listen to that again. The Lord has sworn by by his holiness. Behold, the days shall come upon you when he will take away with fish hooks, take you away with fish hooks, and your posterity, your future generations, with fish hooks. Then turn over to John chapter 14. John chapter 14, verse 30. I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming, and he has nothing in me. I want you to get this, and we're going to revisit this but what is in you has power over you. The ruler of this world is coming and he has nothing in me. Well, you know, I'm, I love to fish and some of the greatest joy you can have is out on the water enjoying the presence of God, enjoying the nature that he created. And I, I'd love to see a largemouth bass take the bait and jump up out of the water, flop that white belly over and go back in and the fight begins. But you know, the hook's important. If you don't have the right hook, you won't, you're not going to land him. If you don't reel it in right, you're not going to land him. I remember a couple years ago going fishing with Timmy Ashton and we were in a weeded area on the Cooper River and he caught Moby Dick. I mean, it was the biggest largemouth bass I'd seen in a long time. It was like eight pounds. And two minutes later, he throws out the same stinking bait and there's another twin Moby Dick on his line. And I'm thinking, God, this isn't right. (laughs) This isn't fair. Where's my Moby Dick? 
But then the second fish, it really made me feel bad because the second fish gets all the way up to the boat, getting ready to scoop him up with the net, and bloop, he spits the hook right out. There are many different kinds of hooks. Hooks are, are devices that are bent, that are shaped, that are, are designed to hold or to pull. They're uh, intended also to attract or to ensnare. Um, there's a different kind of hook, and some of you golfers will be familiar with this. It's the flight or the course of a ball that deviates from straight in a direction opposite to the dominant hand of the player propelling it. Hooks and slices, horrible, horrible things. A hook is also a short blow that a boxer will use with his elbow bent. Short blow can be deadly though. There are hook shots in basketball. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar was a master of the hook shot. But a hook is also a, a quick removal. And you know this in baseball. Like when uh, the ace for the Braves is pitching against the Mets and he, and the, the Mets strike out, you know, that's, that's awesome. But then the Mets pitcher comes in and he gives up three back-to-back -back home runs and he gets the hook. Gets removed. A hook is also a device that's used in music or it's used in writing to grab the attention of the listener or of the reader. A hook is a selling point in marketing. Marketers, marketing experts know how to hook you. Why do you think you have so many ads on Facebook? You know, one post, three ads. And it takes you 30 minutes to scroll to read 10 posts from friends because of all the hooks that are out there. So you can see that there are many different types of hooks. But listen to me, Satan uses hooks to remove your anointing, to impede your progress, to detour your direction, to destroy your destiny, to thwart your purpose, to steal your gifts, to tarnish your testimony, to bring shame to the cause of Christ. Now, I want you to listen to this passage, Amos 4, verse 1 to 3, in the New Living Translation. Listen to me, you fat cows living in Samaria. You women who oppress the poor, crush the needy, who bring, who are always calling your husbands, bring us another drink. The sovereign Lord has sworn this by his holiness. The time will come when you will be led away with hooks in your noses. Every last one of you will be dragged away like a fish on a hook. You'll be led through the, the ruins of the wall. You'll be thrown from your fortresses, says the Lord. So when Amos is writing this, and Amos is, could be a, a variation, a shortened form of Amaziah. We, Amaziah means the burden of the Lord. Amos, the burden. It's so care, you would be so careful that you don't allow yourself to become the burden. But the theme of the book of Amos is the universal justice of God that God is going to bring justice. And, and so Israel was living with this expectancy of the day of the Lord when all of their enemies would be judged. And so the prophecy of Amos begins with God dealing with the enemies of Israel. I mean, he calls them all out, the people of Damascus, King Hazel, 
Ben-Hadad, Ben-Beth-Eden, Gaza, the people of Ashdod, the king of Ascalon, Endron, the people of Tyre, the people of Edom, the people of Ammon, the people of Moab, all their kings and all their princesses. And so Israel expected justice. They expected judgment to fall upon all of their enemies. This was music to their ears. They wanted to hear, oh, thank God. God, hallelujah, judgment's coming on that sorry, sad sack of a reprobate. I know you've never felt like that. (laughs) But justice was coming. But what they weren't prepared for was that the judgment of that day would also fall on them. So they weren't enjoying some favored nation status. As a matter of fact, they would be held more accountable on the day of judgment than their neighbors. What they didn't understand was the hook that was in their enemies was in them. The hook that was in their enemies was in them. First Peter. First Peter chapter 4, verse 17. For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Listen to that same passage Verse 17, but this time through verse 19 in the Message Bible. It's judgment time for God's own family. We're first in line. If it starts with us, think what's going to be like for those who refuse God's message. If good people barely make it, what's in store for the bad? So if you find life difficult because you're doing what God said, take it in stride, trust him. He knows what he's doing and he'll keep on doing it. Matthew chapter 23, verse 28. Even so, you also outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Listen to that passage along with verse 28 in the Message Bible. It says, you're hopeless. You religion scholars, you Pharisees, frauds, You're like manicured grave plots, grass clipped, flowers bright, but six feet down, it's all rotting bones and worm-eaten flesh. People look at you and think you're saints, but beneath the skin, you're total frauds. Amos is referring to a place called Bashan. And, and Bashan was a very fertile area, and, and it's an area where the grass grew really green, and it grew really thick. And the cows that grazed on this grass in Bashan were known to be the fattest and the plumpest and the best cows around. The wives of the principal leaders of Samaria are referred to here by the prophet Amos as fat cows. And the Lord is saying that even the plump, fat Samaritan women, the wives of their leaders, are oppressing the poor. And so he uses this term that just grabs my spirit. He says, the Lord has sworn by his holiness... This is a a message, a theme that keeps coming back in Scripture but keeps being forgotten by church leaders. The holiness of God. The holiness of God. The holiness of God. You see, the holiness of God is a real thing. Now, you may have this generic milk toast image of God that's nothing but mushy love and nothing but tender sentiment. And, but there's this side of God that doesn't get talked about a lot, 
you don't want to mess with. And that's his holiness. In Exodus chapter 15, verse 11, who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Little, little g, lowercase g, false gods. The Baals, the Asherahs, Molech, the gods of this world, gods of perversion, sexual immorality, gender confusion, gods of abortion, gods of murder, gods of violence, gods of rash. Who is like you among the gods? Who is like you glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? In 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 2, no one is holy like the Lord. There is none besides you, nor is there any rock like our God. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1 to 3, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. In Isaiah chapter 57, verse 15, For thus says the high and lofty one, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him who has a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. In Ezekiel chapter 38, verse 23, but I want you to listen to this from the Amplified Classic. Thus, verse 23, thus I will demonstrate my greatness and my holiness and I will be recognized, understood, and known in the eyes of many nations. Yes, they shall know that I am the Lord, the sovereign ruler who calls forth loyalty and obedient service. Revelation chapter 15, verse number four. Who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. For all nations shall come and worship before you. For your judgments have been manifested. Did you see that? All nations will come and worship before him. All the Muslim nations of the world will come and worship before him. All of the Buddhist and Hindu nations of the world will come and worship before him. All of the nations that are controlled by witchcraft, Santeria, Brujeria, all of the nations of the world will come and worship before him. Do you understand that? Do you understand what Paul said in Philippians chapter two, verse number 10, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Every knee, every tongue. In heaven, the angels proclaim Jesus is Lord. On earth, man proclaims Jesus is Lord. And under the earth, the demons have to cry out. 
the spirits, the principalities and powers, the rulers of the darkness of this world, the spiritual forms of wickedness in the heavenly realms cry out, Jesus is Lord. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was, who is, who is to come. Every knee, every tongue confesses the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And the picture that Amos is drawing in chapter 4, verse 2, is graphic. He will draw you away. He will take you away with fish hooks and your posterity, your future generations with fish hooks. They found ancient Assyrian art, illustrations that show captives who are being taken away. And these captives have, hook, have hooks in their noses in this artwork and they have ropes tied to those hooks and they're being led away into slavery. You see, Satan wants to set his hook in you. He wants to hook you with sin. He wants to hook you with iniquity. He wants to hook you with lust. He wants to hook you with pornography. He wants to hook you with sexual immorality. He wants to hook you with sexual confusion and gender identity. He wants to hook you with depression. He wants to hook you with anxiety. He wants to hook you with paranoia. He wants to hook you with mental disorders. He wants to hook you with laziness. He wants to hook you with greed. He wants to hook you with jealousy. He wants to hook you with anger and rage and violence. He wants to hook you with hatred. He wants to hook you with injustice. He wants to hook you with prejudice. He wants to hook you with rejection. He wants to hook you with religion and religious spirits. He wants to hook you with judgment. Mentalism. He wants to hook you with gossip. He wants to hook you with backbiting. He wants to hook you with envy and strife and unbelief. He wants to hook you with rebellion. He wants to hook you with self-righteousness. He wants to hook you with hypocrisy so that you become a whited sepulcher, a man that has a form of religion but denies the power thereof, who can only see the negative, who can only see the bad, who sees no good in the body of Christ. Satan wants to put a hook in you. And in John 14, verse 30, Jesus said, I'm not going to talk much with you for the ruler of this world is coming. Oh, honey, you need to believe Satan's come. The gods of Baal, the gods of Asher, the gods of Molech have come and invaded this age and have taken authority over this age and you are seeing a manifestation of the ancient gods everywhere you turn. They're everywhere. They're in media, they're in art, they're in entertainment, they're in government, they're in business, they're in the mountain of religion. Oh, don't you, don't you think that the church is immune to the false gods of this age? They've come and infiltrated the church and they've come to lead captives astray. They've come to steal your children. They've come to cause your children to be confused with their gender, their identity, their authority, their purpose. They've come to steal and to kill and to destroy. But Jesus said, I have come that they might have life and that they may have it more abundantly. There's going to be a revival in the confused community. There's going to be a revival in the sexually immoral community. There's going to to be a revival in the homosexual community. There's going to be a revival in the lesbian community. There's going to be a revival among the drug addicts and the alcoholics and the perverts of society. There is coming a move of the Holy Ghost that your sons and your daughters will dream dreams and old men will see visions and he will pour out his spirit upon male and upon female and that God God is going to save. He's going to redeem. He's going to heal. He's going to cleanse to the uttermost. We 
are living in the age of the greatest perversion that has been known to man. But we are also living in the age of the greatest revival that has ever been prophesied in the history of the world. So don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. Your acceptance of sin doesn't cause sin not to be sin. Your acceptance of iniquity does not break the power of iniquity. There is coming a time when the God of justice will move from the heavens. And don't tell me that the God of the Old Testament is not the God of the New Testament. The God that brought judgment to Assyria, the God that brought judgment to Edom, the God that, ju that brought judgment to all of the lands of the Philistines is the same God who will judge the world, the living and the dead. Listen, these are serious times. Either you stand for the truth or you'd fall for the lie. I, I want you to see this because this is important. Jesus said the ruler of this world is coming and he has nothing in me. In the New Living Translation, it says, I don't have much more time to talk to you because the rule of the world approaches and he has no power over me. Now get this. What is in you has power over you. What is in you has power over you. But now, listen to this same verse in the Amplified Classic. I will not talk with you much more for the prince, the evil genius, the ruler of the world is coming and he has no claim on me. He has nothing in common with me, nothing in me that belongs to him, has no power over me. What is in you has power over you and what has power over you has claim on you. Do you get that? What is in you has power over you. What has power over you has claim on you. Now, you need to wake up because this is not just the struggle for your salvation, but this is, according to Amos 4 2, the struggle for your generations. Because those who are led off with hooks, their posterity, their future generations would be led away captive. So you've got to understand that what is, what is in you will also be in your children. And what is in your children will have power over your children. And what has power over your children has claim on your children. So very quickly, I want you to turn to Jeremiah chapter 5. This is not in your notes, so you're going to have to pay attention. Jeremiah chapter 5, declare this to the house of Jacob, proclaim it in Judah, beginning with verse 20. Jeremiah 5, 20. Declare this in the house of, Jew, of Jacob and proclaim it in Judah, saying, Hear this now, O foolish people, without understanding, who have eyes and see not, who have ears and hear not. Do you not fear me, says the Lord? Will you not tremble at my presence? Who have placed the sand as the bound of the sea, by perpetual decree that it cannot pass beyond it, and though its waves toss to and fro, yet they cannot prevail. Though they roar, 
yet they cannot pass over it. But this people has a defiant and rebellious heart. They have revolted and departed. They do not say in their heart, let us now fear the Lord your, our God who gives rain, both the former and the latter in its season. He reserves for us the appointed weeks of the harvest. Your iniquities have turned these things away and your sins have withheld good from you. All right. Your level of the fear of the Lord will determine your level of sanctification and holiness. Removing hooks, if you've got a hook in you, removing that hook requires the fear of the Lord. Your level of fear of the Lord will determine your level of holiness and sanctification. How much you fear God will determine how closely you walk with God away from sin. Now that goes against the mushy, feely, milquetoast Christianity that's being touted today. You need a fear of the Lord. Your ability, your sensitivity to listen and to obey the voice of the Lord will determine your level of fear of the Lord. Harden your heart, shut your ears, you will lose the fear of the Lord. You lose the fear of the Lord, you will not walk in holiness. You will not walk in sanctification. You will listen to the voice of the devil. You will gossip, you will backbite, you will slander, you will give yourself to immorality. You will cause, you will cause uh, dirty, filthy spirits to inhabit your dwelling. If you stop and refuse to listen and obey the voice of the Lord, you will lose the fear of the Lord. Hooks come when you lose the fear of the Lord. He said, foolish people without understanding who have eyes but see not, ears and do not hear. Who, who loses the fear of the Lord? People that refuse to tremble at his presence can be in the presence of God in a worship service like we have here on a regular basis, be in God's holy presence and not fear the Lord, not tremble at his presence. He goes on to say they have a defiant and rebellious heart, revolted and departed. Look at this. They do not say in their heart, now let us fear the Lord our God, fear him who gives rain, both the former and the latter rain in its season and reserves for us the appointed weeks of harvest. It is a healthy fear of the Lord that causes the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. It was the fear of the Lord. Jesus said, wait, tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. And there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole place where they were sitting. And there appeared cloven tongues like as a fire that set upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And they descended from that upper room into the streets and saw 3,000 people at the message, of the, the message of the cross of Calvary come to Jesus and repent of their sins and be added to the church. It was sponsored by the fear of the Lord. It was the fear of the Lord that took Jesus to the cross of Calvary, that nailed him to the tree, that held him to the tree. He purposed in his heart, Satan has nothing in me. I, I, there's no rejection in me. As a matter of fact, I'll take all of your rejection. There's no sickness in me. I'll take all your sickness. I'll take all your infirmity. There's no iniquity in me. There's no sin in me. I'll take all of your sin. I'll take all of your iniquity. There's no grief, no sorrow that has a hold on me, no hook to draw me aside. No, I'll carry all your grief and I'll bear all your sorrow. I'll take all your suffering. I'll take all your sickness. There is no hook in me. But he said, 
Your iniquities have turned these things away. Why do you need to quit that addiction? Why do you need to break that addiction to pornography, to lust, to sexual immorality? Because it will hinder you from receiving and being a part of the greatest last day move of the Holy Ghost that's ever been known to man. Don't allow your flesh, your mind, or your tongue to cause you to miss the move, the outpouring at this end time harvest. It's coming. It's coming. The power of the Holy Ghost is sweeping across America just like iniquity is trying to dominate. The power of Jesus has come to set free. The power of the Holy Ghost is sweeping down through Central America, down through South America, across the ocean to England, to Scotland, to Wales, to Ireland. The power of the Holy Ghost is moving across Europe into France and Germany and Belgium. The the power of the Holy Ghost is moving into Russia, into the Ukraine. The power of Jesus is moving down into Asia. He's moving across the Pacific Islands. There is a fire that is burning. It's being exemplified by what's happening in in Maui, but there is a purging fire of the Holy Ghost that is moving across this world and everything that can be shaken will be shaken until what is left is what cannot be shaken. God is moving. Embrace the move of God. God is moving. Embrace the move of God. Don't fight against Against the Holy Ghost. Don't fight against the move of God. Allow Jesus to purify your mind, purify your heart, purify your tongue, purify your hands, purify your feet. Let every part of your being be sanctified by the power of the Holy Ghost. So all of us, we have choices, we have decisions that we have to make. And the wonderful thing about God is the prophet prophesied that the soul that sins shall surely die. Not the father for the children or the children for the fathers, but you and I are accountable for ourselves. That means, as Paul said, it's appointed unto man once to die. And after that, the judgment. You will stand. You and I will stand before the Lord. And we will give account for every word. Every thought, every action, every deed that we ever do. Think about that. And that feeling that you have, that little nervousness that goes down into the pit of your stomach when you think about that, let me help you. That's called the fear of the Lord. Well, I hear people say, yeah, Paul said, work out your own salvation. What's wrong for you may not be wrong for me. I don't have a problem with that. What's, what you can do, maybe I can't do. That's okay. But what they forget is you work that salvation out with fear and trembling. And that fear and trembling comes from the knowledge that one day I'll stand before God. And I'll give account for Mark, not for Peter. So right now, in the name of Jesus, I just release into this body the Holy Ghost fear of the Lord.
May the power and the presence of the Lord come over you. May he come in you. May he fill you. May he overflow you so that you are not a whited sepulcher, that you are not a grave that looks good on the outside, but inside is rotten and decay, full of dead men's bones. I speak to dry bones this morning, and I say in the name of Jesus, come together. Come together. You, you, do you not see the first step of life is coming together? Disjointed people in the church, in the body of Christ, I say in Jesus' name, come together. Come together. Come together. Broken, dry bones, come together. Come together in the name of Jesus. And I call forth the wind of the Holy Ghost, the breath of God to blow, to blow, to blow across dry bones this morning. Dry bones that have come together receive flesh and muscle and sinew in Jesus' name. But just don't look alive. Just don't look good. Breath of God, come in and bring life. I call forth the fresh wind of the Holy Ghost to come on you that you will live and not die. That you will declare the blessing of the Lord. That you will walk and achieve your purpose and your destiny in Jesus' name. And I bind the spirits of witchcraft that have been released against you in the name of Jesus. I command them to be broken. Come on, lift your hands and worship Him. Come on, lift your hands and worship Him. His presence is in this place. This is a holy time before the Lord. This is a holy time before the Lord. Worship Him. Worship Him in the beauty of His holiness. Come on, worship Him. He's holy. He's righteous. Worship Him. He who sits on the throne, He is enthroned in the praises of His people. He inhabits the praises of His people. Come on, worship Him. As you worship Him, He's setting some of you free from addictions. As you worship Him, he's, bringing, he's taking that confusion from your mind and He's removing it. No longer will you be bound by iniquity and perversion in the name of Jesus. Gender confusion has to leave in the name of Jesus. The gods of Asherah have to fall and bow. We will not entertain those that sit at Jezebel's table any longer. We proclaim a revival of the Holy Ghost in Charleston. This is the holy city that belongs to Jesus Christ. And I declare over your posterity, over your future generations, that they will be filled with the Holy Ghost that they will be filled with the presence of the Most High God. That the power of Jesus Christ that set you free sets them free. That the chains are broken off of your posterity. That they are free in the name of Jesus. I declare in Jesus' name, freedom! Freedom to the captives! Why? Because God's children are not for 
for sale. In the name of Jesus.